questions. Hope everyone had a good weekend. Uh, I've now put up a, a lab for FAQ on the course calendar. Um, uh, nice work on the, the design documents. Uh, one, <clears throat> one thing that I wanted to highlight was I know in office hours I previously said uh, when you give a size to like the page file handler it takes a virtual address. You don't know how much memory that address is accessing. If you use AS uh, address space find mem region to find which memory region this address, if any, is located in. Uh, I had suggested putting in uh, eight bytes as the size. Uh, that's a bad idea because the memory address, the access could be as small as one byte and could in fact be to the very last byte of a memory region. And so if you assume it's eight, eight bytes, you're going to think that an access to that last byte of the region is invalid when it's actually fine in that region. So I would recommend using a size of one byte. There were some questions about uh, recoverable versus non-recoverable when we're thinking about page faults. Uh, and the code that's initially in there is code that is making all faults non-recoverable. The initial code, anytime a page fault happens, it either exits the user process or panics if the kernel caused the page fault. We still want that behavior for faults that we can't do anything about. So this lab, we're saying if the fault is to a part of the stack or the heap that doesn't have a physical page, that we can recover from, that we know how to deal with, and in that case, do the necessary steps and then return, which is returning from the page fault handler is how we say, OK, now we're going to recover. And if the fault doesn't meet that criteria, then we still want the kind of unrecoverable stop the user process or panic this kernel. It's also a bit of code in there initially that does an atomic increment of this user page fault global variable that is totally unrelated to the correct behavior of the page fault handler. It's just because the tests need a way to know if page fault has occurred in order to test whether your implementation is correct. Uh, so you should leave that sync and uh, fetch and increment instruction alone because the tests depend on it. And if you change it, uh, the tests will, will not be accurately testing your implementation. Uh, the stack setup function has this argv argument it's doing some other things that aren't related to this kind of defining the region and allocating the first page. This is a feature of being able to run a command in the shell with like command line arguments. OSV currently doesn't support that. You are not required to implement it, but stack setup is where because these arguments, these command line arguments would be put on the user's stack. Uh, so that could potentially be part of a final project, but that is a pretty small feature and by itself wouldn't be uh, a final project. I will say more about the final project uh, on Wednesday. Um, I think all the other questions are pretty uh, short and straightforward. Uh, any questions that uh, weren't in design documents that have come up about the lab that I can answer? All right, let's do a bit of review of paging to start out with. Uh, All right, I have a line of code. P is some pointer. I say star P equals 42. And which of these four would not be a reason why that line star p equals 42 could cause a page fault? Uh, convergence on v, 
or B, that's great. Uh, this, I believe, will be a, a compiler error. So uh, why could, could A, why could the code segment cause a page fault? Code segment read Yeah, we're writing to whatever C points to that's read only that's going to be a fault. How about C? Why would uh, the first access possibly cause a page fault? Because the memory is not allocated yet, so it causes a page fault. Yeah, it's possibly not allocated. Um, but yes, it, it could be that we grew the boundaries of the heap region but haven't allocated those pages yet, and now we're writing something there. That's going to be false. And how about D? There's nothing that you're allowed to access at address zero, or zero, zero, whatever. Yeah, never going to be uh, part of a region you can write to, never going to be a page there you can write to, so you're going to end up with a page false. Any questions on this? Make sense. All right. One more. So, which of these four uh, four operations would require invalidating one or more TLD entries? And I emphasize require because. Uh, I'm looking for which one of these, if you didn't invalidate TLD entries, could give you incorrect behavior. Undefined behavior, we're going to say is okay, but we're going to require invalidating things when it could lead to incorrect behavior. There we go. Uh, and uh, in this case, I think it's D that will definitely require that we uh, invalidate TLD entries. Uh, why, like, why does changing the permissions, like, how could we get just incorrect behavior if we didn't validate? Right. Like, if we have a segment of code that was, or a segment that was really used to be like user write, only, user write, and then we change it to read only and put some code in there, then uh, pro, pro, the program said, okay, go change what's in here, the TLP would see that it's still read and write and allow that, and then you would write to a read only. Exactly. Specifically, if the kernel reduces the permissions for some page, the TLB might have old permissions and allow operations that should definitely no longer be allowed. So, so can it not change the permissions without completely invalidating entire entries? Yeah, if you have changed the page table entry and you have a copy of it in the TLB, it won't reflect those changes. Gotcha. And so you have to uh, clear at least that one entry out of the TLB. Otherwise, an access to that address might result in wrong behavior. Okay. Why is C not correct? Because um, it seems like if you're shrinking the heap, there are pages that are now just entirely unreachable, or should be anyway. So, yeah. So the the way that I'm thinking about this is, I agree. It's when you shrink the heap it is a kind of uh, scenario of concern. Because now there is a part of virtual memory, at least, that is outside of your, your heap region. Um, and you have a, a cache TLB entry that's still going to translate to some physical page. So if you never access this part of the heap that you shrunk, then there won't be a TLB entry because there was never something allocated for it. But let's say that you did access. Uh, then whatever is there is what you put there. And so in that case, like you're reading your own uh, stale physical memory, which like it's not great, but it's not like un it, it's not uh, incorrect behavior. It's undefined. And if that physical memory was uh, uh, actually freed and given to someone else, that's the operation that should that would need to clear the old TLB entry. Because um, then you would have a TLB entry with the wrong PID attached to it. Uh, but just shrinking the heap, we can probably get away with not uh, not invalidating that. At least uh, I think that it's it's not going to like it's it's I would say it's not required in the same way that changing the permissions 
would re definitely require the, the TLB entry to, to be removed. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess it just seems like needlessly risky for no actual benefit. Uh, I mean, it's, you would save a little bit by not having to uh, kind of execute TLB management instructions when the heap size changes. Um, but I would tend to agree that that would be a perfectly reasonable overhead to pay, uh, since we're not likely to, uh, the, the common case would not be the heap boundary is like constantly changing. So we can make that slightly more expensive for added safety. Uh, but I specifically wanted to highlight the changing of a page's permissions because when you implement copy on write in lab five, it is all about changing the permissions of pages. Uh, and there is, uh, the right I mentioned, there's a, a function in OSV to flush the, the clear out the TLB um, that you will that you will want to use for a, for effective execution reasons. Other questions on them? All right. So the topic for today is we are going we are going beyond physical memory and uh, dealing with the question of how can we have and how can we structure the system in such a way to kind of provide uh, at least the illusion of near infinite memory to running processes. As our physical memory, very limited. Uh, but we would like to, uh, to have mechanisms that allow us to kind of escape those limits in some ways. So our physical memory is limited. Do we have a source of storage in our system that is a lot bigger than physical memory? Yeah, we have disk. And disk is much, much bigger than, than memory. We're um, talking something like 100 to 1,000 times more disk space than we have uh, uh, memory, at least in most machines. Disk is also a lot cheaper, so we can more easily add more disk than we can add more memory. And so our strategy is going to be And say, okay, the data, all the data that we need for running processes, that's on the disk. And memory is just going to be a cache for the pages of memory that are on disk. And what would it mean for something to be a cache? I'm going to mine this kind of. It could be thrown away. Yeah, we like. What do we usually want in a cache? What we're currently using. Yeah, it's the idea that like we want the memory that we're kind of that we're currently using in our cache. So uh, the stuff that we need right now would be in memory, and then things that we don't need or haven't needed for a while, those would sit on the disk. And this means that on my laptop, for example, I might have hundreds of applications running. That if all of them had 100% of their code and data and stack and heap and whatnot actually in memory, I just wouldn't have enough. And the system would grind to a halt. Or the more likely, the system would just start killing apps at random to save it from memory death. Which is what Linux will do. It will literally just kill processes at random, and then eventually it will give up and reboot. Um, uh, which is uh, 
why when the Mantis server gets near 100% memory usage, Mike Ty is very worried because if it can't kill enough processes, it's going to reboot uh, and affect everyone who's, who's using the system. All right, so this means that uh, our system can uh, have applications that all together use a lot more uh, memory than we have actual memory because we can keep stuff on the disk. And address translation is a crucial tool because it's going to allow our system to intervene kind of at the time that a memory access occurs. Because when a program takes access to something that is not in the cache, that is not in memory, but is actually on disk, that's a situation where the system needs to bring that data from the disk into memory. And because every memory access goes through our address translation, it's going to give the system an opportunity to say, aha, that's not a valid memory access yet. Let me fix it. And then let you try again. Does that make sense? Questions so far? So the thing that you are implementing in lab four is a couple of particular cases for a general strategy uh, called demand paper. So Lab 4 talks about grow the stack on demand, grow the heap on demand. Uh, why, uh, why is that called on demand? Like, what does that mean in this context? The, During runtime? Yeah, it's while we're running, like right when we need it. Like right when something asks for more memory or, or needs that additional physical page, that's uh, uh, when we allocate it. This uh, this general idea and we're going to uh, what's called multiplex which is a term that just means if we look at kind of virtual pages, we might have several different virtual pages. And if we have physical pages, we have just one of them. And kind of all of these virtual pages are relying on this one physical page. So whichever one of these virtual pages we need at the moment, that's the one that's in this physical page. And the others are in disk. And so we have kind of a limited actual resource, and the multiplexing just means you have kind of multiple virtual things that all are kind of backed by uh, a particular physical resource. Hey, so the, the Chrome physical page is the memory of the RAM. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then how do we know, like, if, if like one virtual page? So like say the physical page has the first virtual page mm -hmm. that's after that one. But then um, so if we call it with the third one, it's not gonna exist anymore. Like how do we know how do we know the physical page is gonna exist? But it's gonna indicate that there's a valid bit. Yeah, so uh, this is an important question. How do we like what is the mechanism we can use to actually do this? And uh, the idea is that, uh, I'll just go ahead and put this picture up. So we have a situation where we have our page table. And let's imagine that we're going to focus on a couple entries in our page table. And 
our page table has our physical page number and for this we can say we have a, a physical page number and a present or you know the thing of this is a, this could be a separate bit than the valid bit or the same uh, as the valid bit, but some bit of information, and we have physical memory, and we have the disk. Is always pictured as, as cylinders for, I assume, historical reasons. Hard drives don't actually look like cylinders anymore. Uh, so, on disk, we have page A and page B. So both our both our pages are in disk, uh, and currently we just have page A in memory. And that means that our page, our kind of virtual page A and virtual page B, okay, the virtual page B is not present, and the virtual page A is present. And so our page table currently, uh, has a physical page number that will translate virtual page A to this physical page. And to Aiden's question, what happens when we access virtual page B? So assuming uh, we'll get into exactly how we decide uh, kind of where we're going to put physical page B, but for now let's assume it gets to virtual, uh, does the page table look up virtual page B? It's, okay, this is not actually present in memory, so it needs to be brought in from the disk. And uh, it decides, let's get rid of page A. And bring in page B. And then update the page table accordingly to say, all right, Page B is now present, page A is not, and page B maps to this physical page. Okay. So when you decide like which is going to point to the same physical memory, um, does it just, once you run out of physical memory, does it just start from the top? Does it start mapping up? And then does it ever like become in conflict? Maybe you use those two, uh, uh, maybe you need those, two. I don't know how to explain this, like you need both of them. Yes, yeah, so it's an absolutely crucial question. How do we decide which pages stay in memory and which ones get kicked out? Uh, in this, just to kind of show how the page table has changed, I, for this example, said, okay, it's going to put it in the same as page A, uh, but we will get to discussing different policies that the system could use to make that exact decision. Oh. How does it know what page B is in the disk? Like, it just kind of, it's just like, no other special page for this process is not doing this, but like, how does it know what it's Yeah, so, another great question. Uh, when we came in here and, and page B wasn't, or we go to access page A now, and it's not in memory, and we need to get it off the disk, how do we know where it is? Uh, there are uh, two, two approaches that we might consider. Uh, one is we could actually use the page table entry itself to keep track of this information. So instead of a physical page number, we store a disk location in that spot that says, oh, you can find this page at this spot on the disk. So that's one way to do it. We just repurpose the page table to now also have disk locations for pages that aren't in memory. Okay. So like, there will be both disk location and and physical page and physical page number, right? 
So for pages that are in memory, it will be physical page number. For pages that are not present, it will be disk location. So it will be one or the other based on is it in memory or, or not. Uh, and then uh, the an alternative would be to uh, also use the file system to do this, where uh, for each, say, segment of virtual memory, we keep an actual file containing the pages in that segment on disk. Uh, and then uh, instead of a like particular location on disk, we know um, uh, uh, we, uh, we would know kind of which segment this page is in, and we'd go to the file uh, for that segment and kind of, if you recall, we, to get the full physical address, we have an offset that we take from the virtual address. We're using the file system. That offset is within the file on disk, the position that page resides. Uh, but kind of either way, you can think of it as if it's not in memory, we have some data structure, either the page table or something else that lets us look up where on disk. Uh, the, the, the contents of the paper. Other questions? All right. So one term that is that is in the reading that is uh, a good one to be aware of is that this space on disk that is reserved for when pages that kind of have been kicked that we don't have room for in memory, let's say. Uh, is called swap space. So we've reserved some uh, chunk of disk space where we're going to put these pages that we're, that we're swapping in and out. Uh, and the kernel may have mechanisms to grow or shrink this swap space as needed. Um, uh, a sort of similar idea, uh, as I know, on Windows, when you put the computer to sleep and it kind of powers off, you want it to be the case that when you wake up that computer, you know, it resumes where it left off. The contents of memory are the same. Uh, and so that you can actually find and uh, I have come across this because I'm running out of disk space, so I want to find the giant files on my system to see if I can delete any. There'll be like a, a hibernation file that's part of the operating system, where which is where it will write all the data from memory when it goes to sleep to kind of put it there, and then we'll read that file into memory when it wakes back up. And that's a similar idea, the sort of swap space where sticking things on uh, on disk that we might need in memory later. All right, so we have looked at how do we uh, uh, how do we do this kind of basic demand thing? How do we how do we uh, kind of move pages back and forth from the disk? Uh, we've talked about kind of where things are stored on the disk and how we know. Uh, but one thing that we haven't talked about this is where does this where does this illusion of infinite memory come from? Because this process of what pages are on disk and which are in memory, the current application doesn't know anything about this. It's totally transparent. From the application's perspective, they access some memory, and maybe it's slower or faster, but the kind of result, it's not distinguishable whether it was on disk or, or currently in memory. Uh, and to provide this illusion, we can think through the kind of steps of a memory access, kind of everything that happens uh, uh, because the operating system is making it seem like all pages are in memory. 
because any memory access that we make to uh, a valid page is eventually going to uh, to, to happen. So I'd like you to uh, discuss with your neighbors uh, if we have if we have a non-resident page and we go to access this page. We have some virtual address that corresponds to uh, uh, page A here, that's sitting on disk. Uh, uh, think through with your, your neighbors, kind of, uh, there should be around um, something like a dozen steps that uh, the system would go through uh, to kind of get to the point where this memory access to this non-resident page actually succeeds. And so this is partly reviewing the kind of whole kind of chain of, of things that happen when we access, uh, when we do a memory access, but particularly kind of what are all the, the points along the way uh, in order to eventually end up accessing page A in memory. So take a few minutes and brainstorm with your, your neighbors and then, then we'll, we'll talk through it. All right, so let's, let's talk through uh, the, main, the main points here, make sure that uh, we have time to to kind of get through our, our whole picture of uh, beyond physical memory today. So uh, what's, what's a, a first thing that we're, we're going to, to do when the, the CPU says, read the data that disappears? Yeah, we look in the TLB. This page isn't in, in memory, so we wouldn't have ever cached uh, uh, an entry port in the TLB. Uh, when we have a TLB miss, uh, where's the next place that we look? Page two. Uh, we do a page table lookup. Uh, when we find that um, we, we find there that the entry says this is invalid. Uh, when we hit an invalid entry in a page table lookup, uh, where does that send us? Exactly. We head to a page fault. Uh, and then this page fault, page fault handler, uh, is what is dealing with uh, let's uh, get this page into memory. Uh, so, what's the the what what about the the page do we need to know in order to, to start bringing it into memory? Uh, yes, we need to uh, locate. Our page on disk, whatever mechanism the system is set up for that. Maybe the disk location is, is actually in the page table. Uh, can we just start reading in the page? No, what do we need to? Yeah, we need to find the Yeah, we need to like find a spot for it in memory before we can actually start copying it into memory. So we need to we need to actually allocate a physical page uh, which might involve evicting some currently resident physical page if we don't have a free page lying around. Uh, then we just do our kind of file I/O, which is going to uh, going to, to be kind of going to start the disk I/O, and then sometime later when 
the disk I/O finishes, there'll be an interrupt uh, when that read is complete. Uh, and so at this point, we have copied the contents of the page on disk into the physical page in memory. Uh, so what do we need to do now in order to kind of uh, uh, set things up so uh, that the uh, process can actually access this memory? Okay. Yeah, so we, it's important we need to uh, change the page table to reflect that we now have a kind of to, to do the change I did up here, mark the new entry is valid. Um, so mark page table entry is as valid or present. Uh, we we're not going to kind of manually go in and change the TLB. Uh, our TLB as a as a cache is going to be, we're going to bring stuff into it uh, uh, when we have uh, a TLB miss. And then if we find a page table entry in the page table, then we stick it in the TLB as a cache. So um, kind of remaining, remaining steps. We're going to resume the process, uh, which just means um, that at whatever instruction caused this uh, this page fault, we'll resume, kind of restart our process there. Our process is going to go through this this uh, procedure again. Uh, Will it be a, a TLB miss or a hit? Yes. Yeah, because it hasn't actually been put into the TLB yet. So a TLB miss. We'll have our page table lookup that succeeds this time and loads that entry into the TLB. And at long last, We'll be able to execute this instruction. And as I, I said before, what's like the the useful thing about this is that from our process's perspective, it accessed this virtual address and then it proceeded with that access having succeeded. And just in the background, all this work took place to kind of arrange memory such that now the thing that this process is looking for is present. Does that make sense? Questions on these, these steps? All right. So I want to... Uh, address kind of one more question um, uh, before turning to how do we decide where to put our page. But let's say we have this situation and virtual page A was in memory and I replaced it with virtual page B. And uh, let's say while virtual page A was in memory, uh, we wrote to it. We changed the data in it. Uh, what consequences, like, what might we have to think about uh, if we're changing uh, a page that's in memory? So, well, we don't want to copy that over to disk eventually, right? Yeah, we, we want to make sure those changes make it to, to the disk. We don't want to have changed the page in memory uh, and then have it the version on disk never see those changes, then we're, so we're eventually going to lose those changes, we would assume. Uh, would we want to uh, 
every time we make a change to the virtual page, make that change to this page? Why not? Super slow. Yeah, our disk is really slow compared to memory, and we don't want to put a disk access on uh, on every on every memory access. Uh, when we talked about caches and writing to caches, uh, there were two cache behaviors in terms of what happens with a write. Anyone remember what one of those is? Uh, like write through and like they have a copy on write or write on command. Copy on write and write on read. That one. Yeah, we have uh, write through, which says when you write to the cache, you immediately write to the next level in memory. That's exactly what we don't want in this situation. Uh, and so when we have memory as a cache for the disk, it will behave as a write back cache. Which is at the point that the data leaves the cache, that's when we write it to the next level of memory. So at the time that we replace page A, that's when we would write all the, the changes or write the, the new page A to the disk. So while it's in memory, it can be changed and the change version only exists there, but when we replace it, we write those those changes back to the disk. Does that make sense? So how how would we know uh, or uh, so we could just assume that every page in memory has been changed, and uh, uh, whenever we we replace a page, we write it out to disk. Uh, why might what what's what downside or or what would be a disadvantage for that? Maybe someone I haven't heard from yesterday. Every time we replace a page in memory, we just assume it has changed and write it out to disk. Why might we not want to do that? Yeah. Writing a page to memory would be pretty slow, and if you just had something, or sorry, writing a page to disk is pretty slow. If you had something in memory just to like read from it, or just because you, yeah, just to like read something from it, then you don't need. There's no changes that have happened. Exactly, we might end up doing a lot of work to write out unchanged, like write to page A an exact copy of what's already there. Like that's slow. We'd like to not do that if we don't need to. So we could write out every page. We'd be guaranteed to preserve any changes, but we might do a lot of wasted work. Uh, so when do we want to write out a page? When uh, it's written or dirty? Yeah, when, when it has been changed and our kind of hardware managed page tables uh, will actually typically include a dirty bit which says this page has been changed. So if page A had been changed while it was in memory, we'd have a, a one to be marked this page is dirty. It has changes that need to be written out to disk. We wrote it out to disk. And then we brought page B in. And at least at the beginning of its life, page B is clean, doesn't have any changes. Uh, that if we kick page B out of memory right now, we wouldn't have any changes to it that we would need to write. Colin? So what's the like where on this the page is? Like if I load page B into memory, it loads the, the like then the page table loads the address of where it is in physical memory. If I then want to put it back, how does it know where it should be then on the disk? Yeah, so uh, I think that in that case you would need um, I would agree that just having the dislocation in the not for in the non-resident page table entries and no other information anywhere in the system about pages on disk uh, would you either sort of don't treat this like a true cache when you load something into memory 
the version on disk is sort of freed up, and then when you write it out to disk, you just put it anywhere. Uh, or you need some additional information somewhere um, to keep track of, of where the pages are. Like maybe there's some kind of page directory that's its own little section of disk where you can look up any particular page where is it uh, on disk. Other questions? All right. So, uh, in the time that we have, um, uh, there are, I guess, two two things that I'll we'll, uh, we'll get to. Uh, we're not going to have time uh, today to talk about uh, replacement policy, how we decide which page. Uh, uh, we kick out of memory. We'll have to get to that next time. Uh, but we do have time for a couple things. Uh, the first is Grover. He's back. So uh, uh, Grover Cleveland holds the distinction of only a uh, person to serve multiple non-consecutive terms uh, as president. So he wins the popular vote in uh, uh, 1888, but loses the Electoral College to Harrison. Uh, he comes back in 1892, uh, gets the Democratic nomination, uh, and wins a, a second term. And uh, he uh, had the misfortune, however, that basically in the, his first year in office, the Panic of 1893 happened as like economic meltdown in the United States. Um, uh, really, really bad uh, few years economically. Uh, so not, uh, not, not great for your political fortunes. Uh, but he was nevertheless uh, kind of continued his efforts at, at reform and, and combating corruption. Uh, he continued trying to uh, uh, lower the tariff. This is a, a political cartoon about uh, Cleveland is is pushing laws to kind of bring the tariff down to a reasonable level, kind of trimming this protectionist hedge. Uh, Uncle Sam seems, seems happy about this. Um, and uh, he was also, a big issue at the time was whether uh, currency would just be backed by gold or gold and silver. Uh, and there were uh, uh, particularly folks with, uh, with debts would benefit if you allowed silver coinage and you inflated uh, the currency, Grover Cleveland was uh, big into just uh, just the gold standard. So here he is fighting the, the, the free silver hydra. Um, and uh, there was also, uh, this was a, a, a time of kind of growing uh, monopolies in US industry. Uh, and so Cleveland was, was pushing this kind of lowering uh, the tariff on uh, on uh, imported sugar, and uh, the the law gets to the, the Senate, uh, and kind of the sugar trust, uh, the, the sugar companies uh, lobby Congress to sort of add all sorts of amendments to basically undo all the changes to tariff on sugar. So this is this is Grover Cleveland being humiliated by uh, kind of the, the 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 senator who who is on on the side of big sugar. Um, and this is a kind of big, a time of big political change in the U.S. Uh, kind of beginning of the progressive era. Parties are, are uh, kind of realigning around business and, and labor unions. Um, uh, there were some big strikes in this in this era, and, and Cleveland was was not not a friend of labor. All right. So, second thing uh, is with this sort of virtual memory uh, apparatus. Uh, we uh, can implement a uh, feature called memory map file. And as we uh, dealt with early in the term, 
And there's normal file I.O. We have a read, calls to read, calls to write. Um, when we have some kind of the kind of the, the non-memory mapped way, kind of read and write system calls, we have to uh, um, kind of uh, We have to copy the data in or out, meaning that uh, uh, the user says write this data to a file, that data gets copied into the kernel, and then the kernel writes that data to the file. User calls read, kernel reads the file, and copies that data back to the user's memory. So a read and write system calls involve this sort of copying data in and out of the kernel. And uh, our memory map files, alternatively, they're going to create they're going to create a new memory segment specifically for uh, uh, for the uh, and then. Uh, this means that that our program can use kind of normal uh, load store like move or or whatever. Um, and use normal load store instructions kind of to interact with this memory segment. Um, and uh, if the program accesses part of the file that isn't in memory yet, triggers a page fault, we can bring it into memory. So page faults. Uh, or when we're kind of loading the file in one page uh, at a time as needed. And uh, our program doesn't have to use system calls, just uses its uh, kind of interacts with its virtual memory, uh, and this is operating on the content of the file. And uh, again, with, with write back, we, uh, it can kind of operate on the contents of a file, and then only when those pages leave memory, or when the file is closed, do the changes actually get, get written back to disk. So we can do kind of operations on file data with the contents of the file in memory. That can be a lot more performant. It simplifies the code because we don't have to have all these special system calls. Uh, we just use normal memory operations. Uh, and it also can facilitate inter-process communication because two uh, processes can memory map the same file and uh, the operating system can allow that to be shared in such a way that it can allow uh, uh, the changes made by one to be seen by the other process. So this provides a sort of specific uh, uh, mechanism to kind of break through the memory isolation that we would normally have with processes. That if they uh, both have some uh, chunk of memory uh, that has been, been mapped in this way. Uh, and on Linux, there's mmap and munmap are kind of Linux system calls uh, that lets you say, okay, here's a file descriptor. Here's how many. Here's how many bytes I want. Like, give me a chunk of virtual memory that corresponds to this file. Uh, you can you and for mmap, it doesn't even actually have to correspond to a file. You can just say like, map me a chunk of, mem of virtual memory this big, uh, and that's a way for say two processes to like share a chunk of memory um, without specifically even needing a file 
uh, on disk. Uh, so in, in practice, memory map files are kind of very useful, allow kind of a, a lot more efficient interactions with files than, uh, than just going through disk. Any questions on this memory mapping? All right, so that will do it for today. Uh, there is a quiz uh, that is available on Moodle due Wednesday, uh, uh, Wednesday 9 p.m. Uh, a lot of the things we talked about today don't exist in OS3, uh, so you should be thinking about them in final projects. Uh, more on that on Wednesday. Our office hour is 4 30 to 5 30 today, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody blew it through.